As the long yellow grass swayed in the breeze, the hunter stayed low. He felt exposed out here, vulnerable. This was risky, not the way he liked to do things. The local intel was reliable. The ancient beast had been spotted for the first time in nearly a decade. He had to take the risk. A day longer and these planes would be teeming with trophy hunters. He didn't trust tech, he relied on experience. Experience that led him here, out in the long grass, chasing a rumour. But it was what made him so damn good. An imperceptible change in the wind direction, a scent in the air. He felt it, that hunch coming good. His heart raced. Up ahead he caught a glimpse. White scales. This was it. He kept low and began to stalk. After a few steps his legs felt heavy. Stuck. He lost his balance. His hand touched something sticky. He tried to free himself, but was quickly entangled in the greenish webbing all around him. The more he struggled, the less he moved. Another flash of white scales, getting closer, and in that moment he knew his experience had betrayed him. Welcome to The Bad Spot, an actual play podcast in which I, Matt Risby, and I alone am playing through Ironsworn Starforged. This is session seven, and things have gotten both worse and more complicated for our hero, Archibalo. He discovered that the conduit, who he thought at first was a fence, turned out to be working some kind of unknown agenda as part of a centuries-old war between the founder clans. We've learned that Clan Thorn are in control of this sector, and it was their banner sworn the archer fought and killed down on Damu. The conduit copied the contents of the databank that he recovered from Damu, uh, and that databank turns out to contain details about the location of a long lost experimental weapon powered by mystic energy. And then she entrusted it to me to deliver to someone called Blake Sutton, who can be found somewhere in the unexplored regions of the Corvus Breach. And just to compound matters, on the way out of Concord, Archer fought and killed another Banner Sworn as he escaped. So there's a war raging in this section, and Archer has very much been pulled right into the middle of it. If you want to follow along, then please do leave a like, subscribe, and click the little bell icon to get notified of when the next session drops. And then that way you won't miss a minute of the action. Right, so, introduction's done. A lot happened last time. A lot of information. A lot of exposition, <laughs> um, a lot of information. So Archer has had his world kind of turned upside down and his worldview has just been completely flipped. The war, the clans, and this weapon. Uh, also the conduits kind of prompt about face. Um, the fact that the conduit seems to know a lot about Professor Darwin or more than she's letting on about Professor Darwin anyway. Um, and now the fact that Archer is kind of seemingly trapped in this, he is now a wanted man. Um, Clan Thorn, the people who primarily want him, also seem like they mean business. They are, they seem a little bit fascist, <laughs> just in their kind of general general appearance. They're heavily armed. They don't seem to ask too many questions uh, before kind of pulling the trigger. But there we go. And that's who's after Archer, who has now killed three of their number through. I mean, I want to say no fault of his own, but. He, you know, he was kind of forced into a into a situation he had to get out of. So, yeah, it's safe to say that all this information is causing Archer to freak out. So before we move on with the action, I think i um, just going to hop back to last section a little bit because um, we didn't do a move that we should have done, which was uh, develop our relationship with the conduit. Because after we delivered the data bank for her, we then swore another iron vow to get it to Blake Sutton. So we agreed to do something for her. So we're going to go ahead and mark progress on that now. With that little bit of um, housekeeping out of the way, let's move on. Faster than light travel in Starforged is done using the Eidolon drives on, on ships, or they're known as E-drives. They are used to jump ships into the drift. And that's where I think we are now. That's where we're going to start. I think we pulled out of Landing Bay 7, leaving the scene of our gunfight with the Banner Sworn and her combat bot behind. And we know that the, the other Banner Sworn are giving chase because we heard it over the radio. 
So I think that Archer just got aboard the Eclipse, got airborne, pointed the ship in vaguely the right direction, and just punched the E-Drive. Now, E-Drives can't take you where you're going all in one go. Uh, you need to recharge them, which kind of handily breaks these expeditions down into mechanical chunks for us. And the description in the book says that you can imagine your ship travelling across the galaxy like a stone being skipped across a pond. And you can be in these little kind of jumps between stops for quite some time. And I think that's where we are now. I think we've been in the drift for a couple of hours. And we're actually mid-move. That move is going to be undertaken expedition, but I'm going to resolve that move in a bit because I think we've got much bigger problems right now. I said Archer has been freaking out, and I think that's because he's realised, after he jumped, that Clan Thorn probably put a tracking device on the ship. And if the tracker is active, he is probably going to ping a response to Clan Thorn as soon as the Eclipse drops out of the drift. So wherever, wherever he stops, it's just going to kind of reveal where he is straight away. And he doesn't know where he's jumping to. So that could be very, very bad. <laughs> so I think the first thing we're going to do is try and find out if there's a tracking device on board. And we're going to do that. I think it's going to be by gathering information. So we're going to roll plus wits. Strong hit. Good start. Wonderful. So we discover something specific. Envision what you learn and take plus two momentum. So momentum's up to five. Okay, so so maybe Archer has been kind of pacing and fretting and, and kind of turning over the events of the past few days in his head and trying to kind of unpick the, the tangled threads that have led him to this point. And I think that as he is pacing and fretting, he, he kind of just suddenly realises the obvious. And he feels pretty stupid because... Putting a tracking device on the ship is straight up the oldest trick in the book. So he kind of is mad at himself and he just starts furiously tearing the cockpit apart and tossing aside charts and instruments and whatnot that have been strewn around before he stops. He stops, he takes a breath, and he tries to think. He tries to be more Archer Barlow. Think. Think where he would put it. Think where the most logical place would be to put it. And I think maybe he checks a few places where he would put it. And I think he strikes gold at the fourth attempt and he finds it, uh, let's say, I don't know, in the footwell under the pilot's console where the, the, in the cockpit, you know, where you, your feet would go when you're driving. And he reaches up into the console and he kind of feels around and there's definitely something there clamped, something metallic where it shouldn't be and with a, a little effort he rocks it loose and it comes away from the console pretty easily and he's, he's kind of stood there looking at it and it's um let's say smooth kind of oval shaped thing like half an egg but maybe like three times bigger like half an easter egg and it's got some lights on it and like little things flickering away and it's definitely a tracking device and it's definitely active so what are we going to do with it should we just smash it or or <laughs> this seems silly that i'm considering this should we use it when I say use it, I mean like use it to throw them off the scent. Could we attach it to another ship or like another stellar object which will cause whoever's tracking him to chase that instead? Or maybe we could use our expertise and our wits to, to hack it maybe, to kind of like rewire it to, to do something else. Or I don't even know why I'm debating this. Let's just fucking smash this thing because th these are bad ideas. So, okay, we're just going to smash it. So uh, Archer takes it into the research bay of the Eclipse where there's kind of like a workbench and it's kind of doubles, doubles as a workshop. There's some tools and things for minor repairs and, and kind of so on and so forth. And he kind of just clamps it into a, a vice that's attached to the, 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 the side of the bench and gets a little hammer and, and chisel. He's not just going to destroy it, destroy it, because I think there's a chance it might set off an alarm that's been destroyed maybe. So he kind of taps gently at the side with a little kind of a chisely pick thing and the top of it pops off with a with a kind of metallic clang and exposes the wiring and, and gubbins inside and kind of gets out a little pair of snippers and kind of moves in like he's almost kind of diffusing a bomb and picks through the wires at which bit is going to be the the most likely part to disconnect without raising an alarm and just kind of snips it gently waits and the lights go out and no other lights come on, so 
breathes a huge, huge sigh of relief. And then he grabs a hammer and smashes the rest of it to pieces. <laughs> um, just out of kind of pettiness more than anything that he fell for such an old trick. So back to the drift. We're still in the drift. And like I said, we are mid-move. Um, ordinarily, we would have done this move before we made the jump, but you know, drama and all that. So this is Undertaken Expedition, and we are definitely trailblazing a route through perilous space. So we're going to give this expedition a name and a rank, as usual. And we're pretty much in needle in a haystack territory here, aren't we? Because we are exploring the vast emptiness of this void down here on the map. But that doesn't mean that it's completely unexplored. It just means that whoever has been here before has not charted it and not shared that information widely. So it's just not widely known. So let's give the expedition a name and it should be find the settlement of Paxton Hold. And how difficult is this going to be? I, I think it's going to be formidable because this is going to take some doing, I think. So we're going to undertake an expedition. We've already made the jump. And by already making the jump, that narratively informs how we're going to make the move. So it stands to reason that because we just hot-tailed it out of Concord without really thinking, the, this is going to be plus edge as we are moving with speed. So let's roll it. It's a weak hit. So we reach a waypoint and mechanically we'll mark the progress first. So yep, yeah, off the mark with that. And now because it was a weak hit, we can either envision a peril or make two suffer moves or one suffer move twice. I'm actually going to skip the peril for now. But what I'll say is because we gassed it out of Concord so quickly, I think it's quite easily to to apply a mechanical penalty here. So let's say because we moved quickly, maybe we burnt the E-drive out a little and it will take a little longer to recharge this time round. So mechanically, narratively, that works as a hit to our momentum. So our momentum is down to four. And we'll also say that the stress of all the fretting and the worrying and the anxiety has fried Archer's circuits a bit and his spirit is going to take a hit. It's now dangerously low down at one. It seems harsh, but narratively I think that makes a lot more sense um, than just jumping from peril to peril to peril. But I think that Archer is kind of fairly determined here and I think he's going to try and resist this harm. So we're going to roll plus heart to see if we can shake this off. And it's going to be hard because it's higher than my spirit. That's that's how bad things are. <laughs> that my one of my weaker stats is higher than my spirit. So, oh, a strong hit. Yep. Okay. Cool. So he's going to shake it off, steal himself, and ready himself for the challenge ahead. So spirit is up to two again. It's still low, but you know these are hard times. So let's describe it. So the kaleidoscope of reds and oranges of the drift begin to fade as we prepare to drop. And Archer just gets behind the controls and takes the yoke and it kind of judders in his hands and the console starts to light up and, and bleep and flash and some alarms start to sound and blare as they, they ready themselves for what awaits them when they drop out. And they drop out into this vast expanse of twinkling stars. But that's not all, of course. We have to ask the Oracle to see what else is there. Let's roll up some detail. Okay, 42 is a starship. That is, <laughs> that's not great. Um, this could be trouble. What kind of starship though? Seven, courier, a fast transport ship. Um, could this be a herald possibly? Should we ask the Oracle? Is it likely? Is it likely this is a herald? We're out in the middle of nowhere, but heralds would be a fairly common sight I would have thought. So 50-50, let's say. Is this a herald ship? No. Okay. So let's get a better look at it, I guess. So and get my little scopes out and kind of check out what I can see. So 82 says scarred hull and 92 says towing or linked. Okay. So as we drop out of the drift, we emerge and our sensors instantly kind of ping the ship. And it's a, it's a long, needle-nosed craft built for speed, but it doesn't carry the Herald's markings. It's similar to a Herald ship, let's say, but it's, it's, it's not. It has kind of big, powerful engines at the back and a small cargo hold. But the cargo hold has got this big, gaping hole in it, like huge. And it's clearly been immobilised. And as I'm looking at it, like kind of through my scope, 
I can see that there's something towing it, and that's how I know that it's, it's kind of dead in the water. But should we say that it's not another ship that's towing it? Should we say it's like an automated kind of drone, like a deep space retrieval drone type thing? Should I do a scan to see if there's any life on board? Is that reasonable? Is it reasonable that my ship has scanners that can detect life? I think maybe, yeah. I think it is, but maybe it's kind of not that detail. I can just say, yes, there's life forms on board, or no, there isn't. The, the ship is clearly trashed, but I just want to see if there there might be any kind of survivors or whatever, or anyone who could possibly raise the alarm would be would be good to know. So let's ask the Oracle. Um, it's, it's in pretty bad shape, the ship, so how likely is it? Should we say it's unlikely? I think it's unlikely that they're, they're survived. It looks pretty damaged, so... Are there any signs of life? No. So it's going to be a while until my E-Drive recharges. Should we get closer? See what we can see? I think maybe we should. We've deactivated the tracking device, so it feels like we've got some breathing space at least. So let's go and see what we can find out. So Archer kind of tips the oak gently towards the ship in the distance and slowly the eclipse glides up to be kind of parallel with it and as i get closer should we see what we can see i think instead of just rolling on the oracles for some flavor and just some basic descriptions i think i'm going to gather information because i'm looking to find out more about the ship and the circumstances it finds itself in and use that information to ascertain something about where we are or what happened to it rather than just rolling up a bit of flavor or detail so we're gonna gather information and um, we're gonna do that by rolling plus wits so a weak hit and it says the information provides new insight but also complicates our quest so what will the complication be i wonder yeah let's say that maybe as we get a better look at the damage and um, what if it looks like the damage has definitely been done from the inside like that cargo hold has been blown out from inside so whatever did it was on the ship as it did and i think that we can ascertain the the fact that this is a courier ship it must have been like ferrying supplies or something important if it moved quickly between settlements somewhere out here and the fact that it's been blown out from the inside twinned with the fact that whoever wanted to recover it sent a bot rather than like a human salvage crew leads me to believe that this is probably probably the work of pirates and in star forge the world of star forge we have drift pirates and this looks like a classic to archer this looks like classic drift pirate ambush they board the ship they rob the ship they scuttle the ship and then they leave and that looks like what's happened here there's no survivors by the looks of it either so fairly ruthless sorts these pirates did we establish anything about like specifically about pirates in world building did we do that in this when we, when we built the sector i don't think we did but did we wasn't it part of the the sector trouble that we rolled up what was that that was no that was about bounty hunters wasn't it bounty hunters search for an infamous fugitive that was our sector trouble I wonder what well, that could be in play. Maybe this could be the work of that infamous fugitive. Maybe there's an infamous pirate roaming these spaceways causing trouble. Either way, I think the complication that we rolled from the week here is that this probably isn't a very safe area. <laughs> but luckily, we've got to wait here for a few hours to recharge the E-Drive. So that's handy. Um, so shall we see what else we can do whilst we wait here um, about to be ambushed by deadly pirates? And we're doing that because we took the hit to our momentum, so we have to wait a little longer. So that's why we're having to hang around. What we can do is let's try and do two things here. Like, my spirit is low. We've established that. I'm quite sad. <laughs> I'm quite stressed. And what we want to do is try and hearten. But I don't want to just roll the dice again and see if I feel better. What I want to do is try and make that narratively interesting. So remember a couple of sessions ago, we established that Archer listens to old recordings of the professor in order to draw a little comfort. And I think we're going to do that again. But if we give it a little bit of narrative thrust, what we can say is, why doesn't Archer scan a whole bunch of the professor's archive to see if there's any mention 
of Sutton Blake or Paxton Hold or anything related to where we're going. The conduit seemed to suggest that by taking this quest, we would get some answers about what happened to the professor. And I'm wondering whether there might be some kind of trail of breadcrumbs somewhere in this archive, in this kind of library of recordings that might give us a clue. And at the same time, strengthen Archer's resolve and lift his spirits a little bit. So let's say that's what he does. Archer heads back to his quarters, brews himself up some coffee, leaves Griff in the cockpit, monitoring the pirate situation, which frankly doesn't fill me with confidence. And yeah, Archer's kind of searching the audio logs for a mention of Blake Sutton or of Paxton Hold. And I think if we imagine this as like a montage of, of him kind of doing this, and he's principally trying to find the information, but yeah, drawing that little bit of emotional warmth and a bit of comfort from the process. So let's hearten and roll plus heart. It's a strong hit. Two strong hits against my weakest stat. Who'd have thought it? Uh, I needed it. And Archer definitely needed that. So Archer finds comfort and his spirit is strengthened. So mechanically we'll take plus two spirit, which pops him up to four. So I think what heartens Archer is that familiar feeling he gets back. The feeling from his old life of like doing research and working with the professor, uncovering new worlds and divining information about past civilizations. And I think kind of looking at some of this old stuff, it all kind of comes flooding back and... I also think that there's something to be said about his encounter with the conduit. And I think that in some way feeds into it. I think as he has a moment to himself, he recalls the intimacy of that physical contact that they shared. And whilst we established that he found her attractive, I think the situation was far too terrifying <laughs> for it to be have any romantic connotations. But he definitely kind of remembers the feeling of that her kind of fingers on his face and that little moment that they shared and it was obviously different from her side but for Archie it was the connection and for him it was sincere and I think he draws some strength from that as well so to answer our question does the archive contain any mention of Blake's son I think this is very, this is very unlikely and it would be terrible storytelling to just uncover the information you need straight away at random but yeah, so but we'll roll it anyway. We'll say there's a very small chance, which is, you know, like a 10% chance of this coming off. Um, so is there any mention of Blake Sutton in the professor's notes? 56, no. Okay, of course there isn't. What about Paxton Hold, maybe? 22, also no. So at least we know. So do we think the E-Drive is charged? That's the next question. I think it has. So I think Griff hails Archer to let him know. And Archer heads back to the cockpit and takes his seat. It's all clear out there, which is lucky. Uh, the wrecked courier ship and its retrieval drone are long gone. And the scanners, kind of quickly looking at them, don't indicate anything else in the vicinity. So Archer powers up the E-Drive. Plots a course in the vague direction, where he thinks packs an hold. Might be. And then the star field outside begins to, to glow scarlet and purple before it kind of swirls and blurs. And the eclipse jumps into the drift. So we're going to undertake an expedition again, but this time I think we're safe in the knowledge that we have deactivated the tracking device for one. And we've had a bit more time to think about what we're doing and maybe kind of make more of an educated guess of where we're jumping to. So this is definitely going to be rolling plus wits. Weak hit. Okay, so we reach our waypoint, but the progress costs us. So we'll mark progress. Um, and I don't really want to make any more suffer moves after the last jump. So should we face a peril at the waypoint? I think I'm ready for it. But first, before we roll up a peril, what we're going to do is we are going to roll up what we see. We're going to roll on the Space Encounters Oracle and just see what, you know, what kind of, what's the vibe like in this bit of space? So as we drop out of the drift, what do we see? 68 debris field and more specifically, debris field colon crystalline asteroids. Hmm. Interesting. So we basically dropped out into a kind of broken up asteroid field. But that's that's not our peril. That's just our situation. What's our peril? 15. Dust clouds in peril, navigation or conceal foes. Okay, so maybe there's these these big kind of chunky crystal asteroids. Kind of like quartz, like big hunks of quartz. 
and they're fairly sizable and and this isn't like this wasn't a peril that we rolled so they're not like super fast moving and they're not going to smash us to pieces we can kind of navigate our way through them if we're careful they're very slow moving but they are big and whenever they collide they kind of grind against each other and churn up these clouds of glittering crystal dust which obscure everything and they'll kind of mess with the sensors and i guess if you get too close they will get kind of sucked through your engine and because it's crystal they're going to do bad bad things to the inside of your ship so yeah not good um it kind of reminds me of that dimitri martin bit where he says that if you're going to use glitter you need to be prepared to have it on you forever because glitter is the herpes of craft supplies <laughs> i think i've always liked that quote about glitter I think that's true here. We don't want it on us because that's going to be bad news. So we're going to have to try and avoid it. But there's kind of vast clouds of this stuff. It says imperil navigation or conceal foes. So yeah, we don't want to take any chances. There might be foes lurking in the glitter mist. Yeah. So we need to we need to navigate this asteroid field. And I think what I'm going to say here is that I think the asteroid field is quite big. And what I want to do here mechanically is treat navigating this asteroid field as the next step of our expedition so navigating this field is going to be progress towards our expedition because i don't want to just keep jump 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 there has to be a bit more to it so if that's the case then there's got to be a waypoint on the other side so i think it makes perfect sense for there to be a settlement on the other side of this asteroid belt and that can be our anchorage. They're called anchorages in the books, a place where you can kind of stop and refuel and recharge the E-drive and so on and so forth, which is exactly what we're going to need to do. So shall we roll one up? Okay, what kind of settlement is this? 43 is an orbital settlement. We haven't had a moon settlement yet, have we? I think we should have a moon base here. I think they're cool. So let's do it. So let's say this is a moon base. And all I need is a name, which is what I'd have pinged on my sensors when I arrived at this this uh, this waypoint. So, what name have we got? What's popped up on the screen? Seventy seven is Rust. Rust. That's a very 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 evocative name. Let's. I mean, it's obvious. This moon is red. <laughs> this is a red moon. It has to be. It just has to be. That's the rules. What is the red moon of Rust orbiting? Six is a desert world. Okay, so okay, so Rust is a red moon orbiting a desert planet. Let's envision it. So, so these huge crystal asteroids slowly spin and turn over in front of us. It's a relatively dense belt of asteroids. It's enveloped in this glittering mist and clouds. And these huge icebergs of crystal quartz continually scrape and grind against each other and churn up more and more and more of this mist but on the other side of the belt in the distance is this deep blood orange moon which at first kind of just looks like a spot on the giant sandy white planet behind it and as archer kind of gets his sense of like perspective and scale he realizes there's that the spot is a moon and it's identified as rust on the scanners and it has a settlement on it and it looks like a perfect place to power down the E-Drive for a bit, charge it up, and maybe lay low for a bit, keep a low profile. This is a dangerously remote place, after all. Could be out of the reach of Clan Thorn, which would be ideal for us. So, let's undertake an expedition to get from where we dropped out of the drift to the waypoint on the other side of the asteroid belt. I think getting through the asteroid belt is going to be fairly straightforward because these are this wasn't a peril that we rolled up. These are fairly slow moving things. But I think that because we rolled the peril of the clouds of crystal mist possibly obscuring foes, but also making navigation more difficult, I think that we are going to maybe try and do this a bit more surreptitiously, try and kind of keep under the radar, keep a low profile, try not to be seen. So we will be rolling plus shadow. So that is a strong hit. Cool. So we reach our waypoint and mark progress. So we are up to three out of 10 on finding Paxton Hold. So, okay, we take it steady. We take it slow. Archer guides the eclipse skillfully, deftly between these titanic chunks of sparkling rock. And he does so by using kind of minimal power, slipstreaming a little bit, using the asteroids to guide him. 
ducking below the clouds of glitter and mist and you can still hear the the bigger chunks of of, of crystal scraping on the harm slow going it's tense but the red moon gets closer and closer allowing him to see whatever settlement the moon is home to more clearly should we roll up a first look for this settlement and see what's on this red moon okay 74 says significant structural damage okay so we'll roll again see if we can find out a bit more 63 is precarious location what could that mean what if it's the moon that has structural damage it's not the settlement what if the moon itself has this massive chunk taken out of it what if there's like this huge gouge in the surface and the precarious location we rolled is that the settlement has been kind of built on the edge of this big this big gouge no it's been built across it let's say across that damage almost like the settlement itself is kind of holding it together. Okay, what if the okay, even better, what if the settlement is like a bridge? The habitations at either end, and the bridge spans this huge crevasse that's been cut into the moon. And it looks from a distance like a giant stitch. Even better, a set of stitches. So there's lots of bridges spanning this gap. It's a really odd looking place. But I can't help it. That's what we rolled playing the oracles. So yeah, there's multiple settlements lining either side of this huge open seam this split seam in the moon and there's bridges connect to each one giving this visual impression that this moon has this giant gaping wound that's held together by these black metallic stitches that is that's kind of cool so we get this visual uh, an archer has seen a lot here in the outlands but nothing quite like this but he's kind of careful and he doesn't let it distract him from the very real danger of being crushed by a crystal asteroid and he guides the eclipse through the worst of the asteroid belt and emerges on the other side. He didn't realise just quite how tightly he'd been holding the yoke. Um, Griff had been quiet the whole time. Archer just assumed he'd gone into, into sleep mode, but he lets out a little. Yeah, that was tense. And I, I think that's that's when we get hailed by the settlement down on Rust. So let's roll up what kind of contact we receive. Okay, 10 is welcoming. I think that's a relative concept, welcoming. I think welcoming in the Outlands is can just be a, like a brusque clearance code being transmitted telling you you've got permission to land, not like the red carpet being rolled out, I think. I think that's relative. So so we're, we're circling and we can kind of see, get a good look at how deep the, the crevasse is. And I think it goes down a considerable distance, like miles and miles, and kind of below the surface, it might probably to like... Do moons have cores? I don't think they do, but like, you know, to the middle. So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty big deal. Um, should we figure out what the settlement is? What is what is this What is this place other than just a cool visual? 45 is manufacturing. What are they manufacturing? Something from the asteroids? Something from the crystal asteroids? Does that make sense? I think it does. I think, yeah, okay. So so let's say that as I passed through the belt, I saw there were like some ships out on, on some of the bigger asteroids doing some stuff. Uh, maybe some bigger security ships I passed on, on the way out of the belt, just hanging out in the background because, you know, this is a resource. They've got to protect it, I guess. And what are they doing with these crystals? What do you use crystals for? Weapons? I don't think that... No, that's a bit boring, isn't it? Um, E-drives? Yeah, should we say that the E-drives like have a crystal as their key component that makes them work? That makes that makes sense. I like that. And let's say that the settlements, let's say the raw materials are processed at the settlements on one side of the crevasse and then they are transported across the bridges to be finished and put into e-drives. That works. There you go. What a cool little place uh, we've just come up with. That's very cool. So that's where we're going. Um, so let's say that on the near side of the crevasse to us, there is a spaceport set some way apart from the factories where the processing is done. This is for spacers and other people. This isn't for people who necessarily live there and work there. So, um, well, in fact, how many people do live and work there? Let's let's roll that up. 93 is tens of thousands. So this is a big, big time place. So let's say that each settlement at either end of each bridge is its own self-contained community of 
a few thousand people who live and work on the moon. Okay, maybe maybe this is the place to make e-drives in this sector. And if that's the case, does it make sense that this place is under clan control? Because if you were if you were fighting a a war, having this kind of facility under your control would probably be beneficial, right? I think that's probably the case. So how are we going to find that out? I'm not just going to roll on the oracle and say is it likely or not. I think we can establish a settlement authority. And we did that during world building. And I think that will tell us if this place is under clan control pretty obviously. What kind of authority is here on rust? 78 is corrupt. So that says to me that maybe the clans don't have control of this place. This place has stayed out of their clutches. So, who runs this place? Someone powerful, I guess, if they've managed to hold off a founder clan like Clan Thorn for a long time. Gangsters? Should it be gangsters? Should an organised crime syndicate be in control of the manufacture and supply of e-drives in this sector? I'm going to say yes. And I'm going to say yes just because that sounds cool. <laughs> They've kept the clans out though, so they must. What have they kept them out with? Hired guns? I guess so. So, yeah, maybe this moon is protected by this mercenary, this kind of elite mercenary militia. And it says corrupt. So, corrupt, does that mean that there is kind of like a, a legitimate face to this operation, but the organized crime syndicate is kind of pulling the strings from behind the scenes? I think that's safe to assume. I think that there's. There is an administration in place, but it's just a, a kind of a puppet for the, the syndicate. And Archer doesn't know any of this. <laughs> this is just for us. Um, but all he knows on arrival as he kind of gets out of the ship into the large, busy spaceport is that there seem to be A, a lot of armed mercenaries, and B, not a lot of questions being asked. So he discerns that there's no formal authority here, no clans. But someone must be ponying up a considerable wedge for all this muscle. So this, the spaceport he's landed in is busy and bustling. But it's nothing like on Concorde. It's not kind of dirty and industrial. I think that over at the manufacturing plants, that's more the vibe. But here, it's a bit more refined, I guess. is well, as refined as refined in Starforge is going to get... But there's a real mix of people here. There's kind of spacers, and I think there's maybe a lot more well-heeled travellers. I think maybe this is a place where merchants and traders can come uh, by the looks of things. And like most spaceports, it's open above in this kind of hexagonal opening. You can see the crystal asteroids kind of slowly spinning in space. But there's no breathable air because we're on a moon. So Archer's got his mask on. And he moves towards one of the many exits, um, which takes him into the, the kind of complex that, that the spaceport leads into. So, should we find out some more about this by exploring a waypoint? I think that's the best the best way to to kind of give this a bit of colour and a bit of a bit of life. So let's explore a waypoint. So when we divert from an expedition to examine a notable location, roll plus wits. Okay, a week hits. Okay, so we uncover something interesting, but it is bound up in apparel or reveals an ominous aspect of this place. Envision what you encounter, then mechanically we get plus one momentum. So we're up to five momentum. So what's the peril? What's ominous about this place? Many, many possibilities. Uh, I think the first place to look here is, I think we're going to roll on the Settlement Troubles Oracle. I don't think we've rolled on that one before, but yeah, let's give that a go. So let's have a roll and see what it throws up. 95 just says roll twice. Great. So this could be more complicated than we first thought. So we're going to roll twice. 63 is social strife. And 5 is blocked resource. Okay. Well, what if we take the blocked resource bit literally? What if there is a blockade? What if there is a blockade on the bridges? that has stopped the process crystals being transported over to the e-drive plants. And the social strife element, what if it is a strike? What if, what if, what we've got here is a good old-fashioned labour dispute? One side of the crevasse is refusing to transport goods to the other. 
The bridges are literally blocked. They're closed off to transports moving between each side. And maybe that explains a little more why the mercenaries are here. <laughs> why there's so many of them anyway. Maybe this crime syndicate is gonna, you know, dip their toes into a bit of union busting, a bit of strike breaking. Yeah. So how does Archer find this out? So, well, I think, I think he finds himself in like a canteen area, um, the central kind of bar bit where travellers might kind of blow the suds off a few whilst they recharge their drives or where some deals might get done, maybe. And I, I think it's like a clean, kind of sterile, bright looking place. It's, it's not much atmosphere. It's think if you think like more like a brightly lit motorway service station rather than the kind of dingy Tatooine cantina. I think that's the vibe. It's expensive and, and kind of Archie gets a coffee and, and finds himself a, a booth out of the way. But learning all the stuff that's going on here is, is unavoidable. I think there's kind of loud arguments across the room in, in favour of the strike or against the strike and there's, there's people stood on tables kind of addressing the room and there's a lot of information flashing up on screens. There's like scuffles and a lot of tension in the air. It's, the strike has maybe been going on a while, I'd say. Um, maybe long enough that like production has not just slowed, it is ground to a complete halt. And maybe this place isn't normally this busy. Maybe there's there's just been this huge influx of, of not just like mercenaries, but also like negotiators and, and kind of industry big cheeses who have, have kind of want to settle this dispute and, and get production going again. And I think that the more I talk about it, the spaceport and this kind of main complex and the raw crystal processing plants, I think, are on this side of the crevasse. And the bridges go across the crevasse and they go to the E-Drive manufacturer plants on the other side. And I think it's the E-Drive manufacturers who have the beef. They're the ones who've kind of down tools and refused to work. And I think that I think we have to use some dramatic license here to say that the bridges are really the only feasible way to cross. So they brought production to this kind of shuddering halt. And that's why there's so many people determined to get things moving again by kind of any means necessary. So this is the backdrop. This is the backdrop of what is going on here. Um, and, but what does Archer need to do? Why is he here other than wanting to wait for his E-Drive to charge? So what he wants to do is find out more about Paxton Hold or about where we're going um, if not like a map directing him straight there which would be handy at least some information that might give him a clue that, he, that he's even heading in the right direction and I, th I don't think it's feasible just to wander up to someone and ask them but um, I was thinking I've been thinking this quite a bit between sessions and we haven't established this but I think I'd like to establish it now is it outrageous to suggest that people in the world of the game trade in navigational information like can you just turn up to a place like this like this kind of spaceport and buy information on routes and passages i think that it's not outrageous that there probably is that trade and and and, and i think they're fairly common they're basically information merchants aren't they and they specialize in navigational information but i also think that it's important to establish that the information they sell is is not always reliable. It can be kind of piecemeal or incomplete and navigating using that information can be very dangerous. So it's a very risky proposition, but having vague information is better than having no information. So I think that's kind of how they exist. And I think we should give them a cool name. I think we should give them a name based on something from like the real world, like our world, that is perhaps carried over into the forge. So what could we call them? Astrolabes. I think these people are called astrolabes. Ast an astrolabe is an old school navigational instrument. And the astro bit, I think, makes it sound kind of futuristic and spacey. So astrolabes. So, cool. Amongst all this drama and, and of the strike and, and all that stuff... Archer has to find an astrolabe where he can try and get some somewhat reliable information about where Paxton Hold might be. So he leaves the canteen and there's kind of still arguments raging around him between 
both sides of this this labor dispute and he heads out into the one of the corridors and i think that they're kind of lined with vendors selling various things and goods and services and maybe there's somewhere you can go and you can kind of buy a claim to go out and do a bit of your own crystal mining on one of the asteroids and maybe there's somewhere where you pick up your information from the heralds and i think archer thinks about doing that but thinks twice because you know he's trying to keep a low profile and essentially checking in somewhere is probably not the wisest idea um he doesn't want to make himself known here because that could be dangerous whilst this place isn't under clan control the walls could definitely have ears so let's say that in this corridor amongst all these vendors there is this solitary astrolabe sat at the end archer kind of checks around make sure he's not being watched and tries his best to to kind of walk up and kind of be casual and try not to draw attention to himself and let's let's describe this astrolabe first of all i think uh i think they're kind of a super old kind of like wizened man kind of skin has craggy appearance he's seen a lot of stuff he's got kind of thin white hair sticking out from holes in this this beanie hat and it looks kind of surprised as anyone that, that he's, he might have a customer. And he kind of points Archer towards the monitor that faces outwards. He's got, let's say that the astrolabe is sat behind this, this weird console with a monitor facing outwards towards the customer and a monitor facing towards the astrolabe. And he kind of motions at everything with his hands and kind of these big exaggerated gestures. So he either can't speak or there's maybe a language barrier. But either way, he's been doing this a while. So it's, he's kind of he's kind of made it work. So how does this work? So I, I think that I think that they literally just charge you for using the terminal, like paying to Google something, essentially. Um, it's a ripoff, but this is otherwise like hard to find information. And I think you pay with information. So I think, again, we haven't established this, but I wonder whether your ship's navigational information is stored on like a drive and when you leave your ship you kind of take it with you you just kind of unplug it and you take it with you or it's stored on like a navigation bot or something and it's small enough that you can kind of keep it in a satchel which is handy because that's what archer has and it's important information it's where you've been and and it's where you go and i think that when you require the services of an astrolabe i think you you hook up your navigation bank to their machine and they will trade you information for the information you have. So it might come up and say, hey, you've got information on this sector that I don't have on my astrolabe equipment, and we're going to swap that. The trades can commonly be unfair, um, and I think that they drive a hard bargain. So maybe the harder to find place you're looking for, the more information it's going to cost you. So maybe that's why the information that the astrolabe's kind of give out is so unreliable because basically it's just crowdsourced and there's no guarantee that the crowd are sourcing reliable information so that's why that's why you're taking your chances every time you use an astrolabe so he kind of gestures to archer of what he wants to do and, and archer reaches into his satchel and, and kind of finds his his uh his navigational drive and, and pulls the cable from the from the console and, and kind of plugs it in and, and kind of taps on the keyboard on, on his side of the screen and kind of just types in as he looks over his shoulders both ways up the corridor just to be sure that no one's watching him. Uh, he types in Paxton Hold. So what's he what's he going to offer to trade? So I think, so the astrolabe looks at his side of the screen and kind of looks up at Archer, looks back at the screen and then kind of types something into to his side and then it appears on Archer's screen of what, the trade is is offered and it's ridiculous it's it, it's like he scanned archer's drive and seen what's on there but not any details and has asked for a whole bunch of information a whole bunch and it is that's not a fair trade and archer just kind of shakes his head so we're going to make a counter offer and kind of archer types that into to his side of the console and because this is bartering this is going to be a move called compel, which is when you try to persuade someone or make them an offer, envision your approach. And then if you try to barter, we're going to roll plus heart. 
And we've done all right with rolling plus heart this session, so what could go wrong? That could go wrong. I could roll a miss. And a miss where my momentum will not bail me out. So that's a hard no. <laughs> so maybe the, the astrolabe reaches over and he just yanks his cable out of my drive and just sits there and folds his arms and scowls at me. That is a hard pass. He is not interested in any of my information. <laughs> Thank you very much. And he's not going to help me. So the astrolabe refuses or makes a demand that costs you dearly. Then you must pay the price. Okay, well, well, I mean, we, he's just not interested. And I don't think he would ask me for anything else. That doesn't really make any sense. So I think what we can ascertain from his reaction is that the information that I wanted of where Paxton Holders is probably quite valuable and worth quite a lot. And my offer was derisory to him anyway. So, or maybe it's just like an old as dirt sales tactic. <laughs> he's just playing hardball. But anyway, he's not interested in my poultry offer and is refusing my custom, which is a little touchy, if I may say so, but, you know, it's a hard life out here and who am I to judge? So I'm going to pay the price now. But, but what I think might be fun and fun in inverted commas is instead of taking a mechanical penalty or just picking off the pay the price table, I think I might introduce a plot twist. Now, why would I do that, you say? And I think it's because this session has gone pretty well, almost too well. And like that was our only miss we rolled. And I think that, frankly, it just doesn't feel like we're playing Iron Swan. <laughs> and, you know, success is not interesting in a story sense. So we need to drum up some good old-fashioned complications. So we're going to roll on the story complication oracle and see how we're going to ruin things. Okay. 74 is two seemingly unrelated problems are shown to be connected. Interesting. Okay. So what's that going to be? Right. I have it. I have it. So these astrolabe terminals are mainly for navigation. But I think you can use it to find other information out too. And I think that when they're not in use, the screens that face outwards, the customer facing screens, just kind of cycle round important information. Like, you know, notifications of like important events and stuff. Not quite like a billboard or an advert, but you, you get the picture. And I think as the astrolabe reaches over and pulls the, the cable out of his hand, he snatches it back off Archer, the screen resets and goes back into this information cycle. And it resets to what looks like a mugshot and information about a bounty. Now, we rolled up that bounty hunters are searching for an infamous fugitive in this sector, right? Well... From what Archer is looking at, it seems that this infamous fugitive is called Blake Sutton. Thanks for watching, everyone. Um, please remember to like, subscribe, and click the bell to get notified. And if you want to submit a tale from the drift for me to read at the start of the episode, then please do get in touch using the details on the screen now. Until next time, it is farewell and safe passage.